The ending of World War II brought us into a new era. For the first time, mankind had the ability to completely destroy Earth. Those first two bombs dropped on Japan released an amount of destruction that previously required thousands of bombers with tens of thousands of bombs. In the years to come, the bombs got bigger, till finally, only 16 years after World War II ended, the Soviet Union tested codename AN-602, better known as Tsar Bomba. The blast yield is estimated to be the equivalent of 50 megatons of TNT, or to put it in perspective, that is more than all of the bombs dropped in World War I and World War II times 10. To date, Tsar Bomba is still the largest nuclear test, but there is no physical reason why we can't build larger. The Soviet UR-500 Super Heavy ICBM could have carried a bomb with a yield of 100 megatons and possibly larger. The reason larger bombs haven't been built is because it's more efficient to have more, smaller bombs that can be spread out over an area and cause much more damage to a larger region. Also, the accuracy of ballistic missiles has improved to the point where you can hit smaller targets with a smaller warhead, creating less collateral damage. This has led to tens of thousands of nuclear bombs being built. With the massive number of nuclear weapons, and the amount of destruction and loss of life that would occur in the event of a nuclear war, there have been many discussions on how to lessen that threat. Several arms control treaties and agreements have significantly brought down the number of these weapons, from an estimated 75,000 in the mid-1980s to around 15,000 today, many of which are in the process of being dismantled. Some groups have actually proposed completely eliminating all nuclear weapons. Just recently, 80 nations signed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in the UN, with the ultimate goal of complete and total elimination. However, not one single nation which possesses nuclear weapons signed the treaty. So if you can't get rid of all nuclear weapons, another way to stop a nuclear war would be a defense against them. The first nuclear weapons were delivered in the form of bombs dropped by aircraft. Bombers are slow, and advances in air defense technology make it highly unlikely that they will be able to complete their mission. Most nuclear weapons today are delivered by ballistic missiles. This missile technology, which first became operational in the 1940s, is still the most effective and reliable way to deliver nuclear weapons. They are extremely fast and fly extremely high, making them nearly impossible to shoot down. But if you could stop them, you would greatly diminish the threat posed by nuclear weapons. There are other nuclear delivery methods, such as cruise missiles and even now torpedoes, but those have other problems. Today, roughly 85% of all nuclear warheads are launched by ballistic missiles, the remainder being on bombs and cruise missiles. So if you could shoot down the large, slow-flying bombers and cruise missiles, and find a way to defeat ballistic missiles, you could all but eliminate nuclear war. To figure out how to defeat ICBMs, first you need to break down their characteristics. Basically, there are three phases of ballistic missiles. The boost phase, where the missile first launches and is burning its engine to get up to speed. The mid-course phase, where the engine is shut off and is now coasting through space. And finally, the terminal phase, where the warhead re-enters the atmosphere and hits its target. Terminal phase is extremely difficult to defend against, as you have very little time and the atmosphere is slowing down the warhead, making calculating an intercept path more difficult. Mid-course phase is somewhat easier, as it's the longest phase of the missile flight. It is also in space, and therefore for the most part, coasting on a predictable path. The problem is an interceptor missile needs to be extremely large, pretty much the same size as the ICBM, to get up to that altitude to hit it. Also, if the missile has multiple warheads, they separate from the bus carrying it in the early mid-course phase, so this means you'll have many more targets to hit. The boost phase is the most vulnerable. As it's a large target, the warheads haven't separated yet, and it is traveling at the slowest speed as it boosts itself up into space. The problem with defeating missiles during their boost phase is you have very little time to react. You also need to be relatively close to the launch site, as every second that passes, that missile is going faster and faster, and quickly will be out of the area. There have been several methods devised to shoot down intercontinental ballistic missiles. The two primary are interceptor missiles, and lasers and other directed energy weapons. Interceptor missiles may be the most obvious. You launch your own missile to destroy the enemy missile that is coming at you. This, however, is extremely, extremely difficult. You might have heard the expression that it's like hitting a bullet with another bullet. Well, these missiles are traveling 10 times faster than bullets. 
but you also get to cheat a little bit by using a computer to calculate and make adjustments. In the early days of anti-ballistic missile research, the technology was not good enough to do this. Radars were not as precise, and guidance systems not capable enough. So instead of hitting an incoming warhead, interceptor missiles had their own nuclear warhead on board which would fly up close enough to the target and detonate. The resulting blast would hopefully destroy the incoming warhead. The Soviet Union was the only nation to deploy an operational ABM system armed with nuclear warheads, the A-35. This method is the easiest way of destroying incoming missiles, but there are many problems with such a system. One being that you are detonating a nuclear bomb over your own country to shoot down other nuclear bombs that are trying to detonate over your country. The best option would be to smash directly into the incoming warhead. This way, there's no nuclear blast. This however requires extremely precise radars to be able to detect and track a warhead, which is no bigger than the average person, that is flying through space a thousand miles away at several thousand miles per hour. You have to be accurate to less than a meter, or you will miss. This type of interception is known as hit to kill. Typical surface to air missiles that are used to shoot down aircraft have small warheads on board themselves with a proximity fuse. This will blast hundreds of metal rods or shrapnel over a larger area. This way, you do not have to be quite as precise, but when you're trying to shoot down missiles, this is often not enough to guarantee the fragments will destroy the warhead. This hit to kill method is extremely difficult. The US has spent several billion dollars developing the ground-based mid-course defense along with its GBI interceptor missile. And despite all the research, development, and money, it has only been successful 55% of the time. To make matters worse, interceptor missiles like the GBI can only destroy one warhead. This means you need at least one interceptor missile for every enemy ICBM fired. With only a 55% success rate, you will need to launch several interceptor missiles to increase your chances of success. Right now, the US plan is to launch four GBIs at each warhead. If you figure a 55% success rate for each interceptor, Four gives you a 96% chance of success. Also, ICBMs can carry multiple warheads. This means even more interceptors. On top of that, ICBMs can carry decoys. These are designed to throw off ABM systems. And finally, an enemy can simply build more missiles than you can build interceptors. ICBMs typically cost much less than these huge interceptor missiles like the GBI, as they do not need all the extra maneuvering systems on board to fine tune its course to hit the target perfectly within a matter of centimeters. It's a numbers game. You can't possibly build enough interceptors to fully stop a large scale attack. The GBI is often presented showing its ability to distinguish between decoys and real warheads and there are plans to place more than one EKV, or exo-atmospheric kill vehicle, on each interceptor missile. But this will likely still fall way short of ever being a reliable method of fully stopping an attack. Another solution is needed. In the 1980s, US President Ronald Reagan announced a new ABM system called the Strategic Defense Initiative, better known as Star Wars. It was a huge project devoted to finding ways to stop a nuclear attack. Research was done on every conceivable method to defend against ICBMs. Everything from particle beams to rail guns, space-based kinetic interceptors, and much, much more. But a major focus was on directed energy weapons. This included lasers and x-rays from platforms both on land and in space. The program was extremely ambitious for its time. The technology of the day wasn't good enough, and much of it still isn't. Lasers may seem like the best candidate, but there are several problems with them. One is obviously the technology requirements. After many decades of work, just now are much smaller and weaker laser weapons slowly becoming operational. A laser capable of shooting down an ICBM flying hundreds or even thousands of kilometers away will need to be extremely powerful. Land-based lasers also have to travel through the thick atmosphere, which distorts and scatters the laser beam. In 1997, the US tested the Miracle Laser, which produced over one megawatt of power. This is over 100 times more powerful than the LAWS demonstrator that we've all seen in this video. The Miracle Laser was tested against a decommissioned satellite. The test failed, with the laser being damaged in the process. The Soviet Union also worked on laser missile defenses, the Terra-3 being the most famous. However, it was also not successful. The YAL-1 Airborne Laser was another program that made it pretty far through the development phase and into the testing phase. Since it's airborne, 
the laser travels through less thick of an atmosphere. It was placed in the nose of a Boeing 747 and would shoot down ballistic missiles in their boost phase. As I mentioned earlier though, this requires the aircraft and laser to be relatively close to the launch site. The airborne laser never reached its ultimate goal, but the plan was to have it have a range of 600 kilometers against more vulnerable liquid fueled missiles and only 300 kilometers against solid fueled missiles. While that may sound like a lot, you couldn't shoot down any missiles launched from larger countries like Russia or China without flying into their airspace. It would give you the ability to shoot down missiles launched from most places in North Korea from South Korea, which was a more realistic role for the YAL-1. After its cancellation due to high cost, short range, and technical difficulties, the US Missile Defense Agency has began looking into placing a laser on board drones. This would, they hope, be cheaper, could fly in closer to launch sites, and take advantage of new technologies that have emerged since. However, with the massive 747 being unable to produce a strong enough laser, which according to Defense Secretary Robert Gates would need to be 20 to 30 times more powerful, it is questionable how this would be carried out by a much smaller drone. And finally, since the atmosphere greatly hinders laser weapons, how about placing the weapons in space? Both the US and Soviet Union considered this option. The Soviets even launched the Polya spacecraft, which failed to achieve orbit and crashed into the Pacific Ocean and was destroyed. Since then, space-based lasers have been mostly kept to the drawing board. One major problem with them is that, in space, you need to be traveling at nearly 30,000 kilometers per hour just so you don't fall back to Earth. This means you will likely not be in the right position to shoot down a missile when it launches, so you would need dozens, possibly several hundred satellite lasers to cover an area 100% of the time. You could place the satellites in a higher orbit, known as geostationary orbit, where the orbital speed matches that of the rotation of the Earth. This means that the satellite can remain over the same region of the Earth. The laser would have to be much more powerful though, as it has a much longer distance to travel, and also requires much more powerful rockets to boost it up to geostationary orbit, which is roughly 100 times higher than the typical low Earth orbit altitude. Another issue is the power requirements would be high as well. Most satellites and spacecraft currently rely on solar panels, but these do not produce much power. The massive 2,500 square meter solar panel system on the International Space Station only produces 240 kilowatts. And even that took dozens of launches and manpower to assemble in space. A space-based laser would likely require more than this and need time to recharge between firing. You could use a chemical powered laser like the Polyus, but this would require refueling the satellite once its stores are expended. There is also another problem with the enormous amount of heat that these lasers produce. Getting rid of heat is extremely difficult to do in space. Massive radiators would be required, and even that might not be enough. And all this is still contingent on having the technology to create and launch such a powerful laser into space. You'd also need an extremely complex network of radars and other sensors to detect and track missiles and be precise enough so that you can engage them. Also, one would not be enough you would likely need a huge constellation of these satellites. So, there are numerous problems with each method put forward at missile defense. And to make matters worse, most of these systems can simply be overwhelmed by the enemy simply building more missiles. All these defense systems are extremely expensive and cost much more than the missiles they are designed to stop. Furthermore, new technologies are being developed to make stopping a nuclear attack even more difficult. During the late Cold War era, both the Soviets and Americans worked on maneuvering warheads. These weapons, upon re-entering the atmosphere, could change course with flaps, similar to that of an aircraft. Images of what these look like are extremely rare, with only a few real pictures on the internet. These maneuverable warheads had a few purposes. One would be to more accurately hit a target, or even a mobile target, with terminal guidance, such as what the Chinese are doing with their anti-ship ballistic missiles. They also make interception of them much more difficult. You can see here in this declassified image a test of the advanced maneuverable re-entry vehicle by the US in the 1980s. You can see it makes a very sharp course change after hitting the upper atmosphere. Some of this research has morphed into current hypersonic weapons development. These are weapons that are somewhat similar to ballistic missiles, but fly much lower, skipping through the upper atmosphere and using it to change course. These are extremely difficult to defend against. Another example would be Russia's Poseidon, a nuclear-powered, nuclear-armed torpedo. Nuclear-armed torpedoes have been around since the early days of the Cold War, 
but having a nuclear engine on board gives it virtually unlimited range. Currently, there really isn't any good way to intercept a torpedo. The US has worked on a few methods in the past, and a German company has been developing a system called Sea Spider, but it is doubtful that any such weapon would be effective against Poseidon. And finally, do we even want to be able to stop a nuclear war? In 1972, the US and Soviet Union signed the ABM Treaty. This put severe restrictions on building anti-ballistic missile systems. One of the reasons for the treaty was the realization that if one side was able to completely stop the other from attacking, the balance of power would be upset. At that point, there would be less risk in starting a nuclear war from the side that has a fully capable ABM system. The entire concept the Cold War superpowers relied upon, mutually assured destruction, would go out the window, as an attacker would no longer have to worry about nuclear retaliation. The same is true today. Even if all sides had a fully capable ABM system able to completely stop a nuclear attack, or if the UN was able to completely ban and eliminate all nuclear weapons, it could be argued that large-scale conventional war would become a much more common thing. We had two world wars within a 30-year period. However, with the development of nuclear weapons and the realization of the destruction a nuclear war would bring, we never had a third world war. There were many close calls during the Cold War. In fact, in the past, wars have been started over less provocation, but there still wasn't a World War III. So, it's possible that the only way of truly stopping a nuclear war is to not have the ability to stop a nuclear war. And finally, I just want to say thanks to Ivan Stepanov for letting me use some footage from his new nuclear war simulator. It's not out yet, but it looks like an incredibly interesting tool that I know I'm going to have a lot of fun playing with. In the meantime, go over and check out his website. I'll put the link down in the description.